question. Thank you. The question that comes up is, well, what is internal family systems? So internal family systems is a trauma focused therapy in which you work to identify the specific sub personalities. That's also known as families, the sub personalities or families that make up your internal mental system. Now, one of the beautiful pieces about internal family systems is that it is a family therapy that looks at the internal processes within yourself as a family. And how is that internal process working? How is it working together? How is it not working together? Um, it, 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 it's the image of a family if you can think of those parts of yourself as family. So once you identify these parts, as a therapist, you will help uh, your clients acknowledge their feelings about the, uh, the suppressed emotions that they feel and learn how to release those feelings so that they are freer to address the actual problem and ultimately find more positive ways to manage conflicts on your own. So that is the gist of what it is. And what the model aims to do, it aims to differentiate the self from the other parts. And what are those other parts? Those other parts are protectors. That is called a, a manager. One protector is a manager. One protector is a firefighter, and one protector um, is what we call exiles. And so these parts, they make up a person's inner world. And so the ultimate goal of the internal family systems model is to unburden or to restore those extreme and wounded parts and establish a trusted, healthy, harmonious internal system that is coordinated by the self. So the goal in using, I'm going to call it the IFS model, which is internal family therapy model. The goal of using the model is to help clients access that self so that they can heal those wounded parts and bring their minds into balance. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Okay, I'll read, I will say that again, read it again. The goal of IFS is to help clients access self so that they can heal the wounded parts, those wounded family members within and bring their minds into balance. Okay, and so how does change occur? How, how do we, how does IFS help people change? Well, it helps them by helping to achieve balance and achieve harmony within the internal system. It helps change to occur by learning to differentiate and elevate the self so it can be an effective leader in the system. So when the self is in the lead, the parts will provide input to the self. However, the parts will always consistently respect the leadership and ultimate decision making of the self. All parts will exist and lead talents that reflect their non extreme intention. So these parts are not terrible parts. Okay. They all live with inside of us. These protectors all live with inside of us and they're there to function and help us as we live life and go through whatever we go through in life. However, the self is that part, that quiet part of ourself that is observing, giving direction, giving leadership to those parts. And so when those parts through trauma act out in extreme, when those parts through whatever 
situation that we're going through, act out in extreme. The self, the role of the self is to take leadership. Sometimes the self is observant and is learning from these parts. Okay, and sometimes it will sit back and watch how these parts are activated and how they function. Um, and sometimes it will take leadership um, and, and leading the part through whatever a person is experiencing. Okay, because the ultimate goal is that all parts will exist again and lead talents that reflect their non-extreme intention. So let me just um, put more clarity on these parts in terms of definition, because I have a video that I would like to show you um, about internal family systems. Uh, and if you have questions while you are watching the video, um, feel free to put it in the chat and hopefully we'll have some time at the end where I can address it, okay? So what is an exile? The exile is that young part that has experienced trauma and often becomes isolated from the rest of the system to protect you from feeling the pain, protect you from feeling terror, protect you from feeling fear and anything else um, that it needs to protect you from. Um, it, lead, it can lead you feeling fragile and it can lead you feeling vulnerable. When that exile is triggered, another part might come in to rescue the exile. And that part might be the manager. The manager might say, well, let me help out. Let me take over. Okay. So that manager is that part that helps to run that day-to-day -day life of an individual. It attempts to keep you in control of every situation and relationship and in effect to protect parts from feeling any hurt or rejection. Um, and it could do this any number of ways through a combination of parts, you know, by striving, it could do this by being controlling or by evaluating or caretaking. The manager is coming in to rescue the exile from not feeling and functioning in the extreme way that it's functioning. So you ever find yourself in a situation where you feel like, oh, this is just not going to be good. This is just not going to be good. And the manager part of you comes in and say, okay, I got you. Let's, let's, let's pull it together. Let's, let's, let's get through it. Okay. So it kind of works to help protect that exile and what's showing up, but it can work in extreme. But if the manager doesn't do a good job, then that other part, which is known as the firefighter might just come in and just take over. And that firefighter is that, is that part um, that reacts when exiles are activated in an effort to control and to extinguish their feelings. And they too um, can do this in a number of ways, okay? It can do this through numbing yourself through drugs or alcohol or self-mutilation or binge eating or sex, a number of things to firefight. Firefighters is, is about extinguishing it, okay? Let's, let's just nip it. Um, and they have the same goal as the manager. And that is um, to keep exiles away, but have different strategies in how they do that. So let me set up the video so you can see it. And again, this, let me see it. Okay. It's the activity in the chat already. Okay. So I'm just checking to see if I need, okay, besides the names. Is it okay, Dr. Bayman, for people to ask questions in the chat while the video's on? Okay. Sure, that'd be, that'd be fine. Yeah, and then you could go back and, and field those. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. thank you. All right, here we go. Let's see. Hello, my name is Dr. Cynthia Chestnut, and I'm a full faculty of the Magic Family Therapy Program at Capella University. We're going to do a telehealth session on internal family systems. 
also known as IFS. The question is, what is IFS? IFS is a trauma-focused therapy in which you work to identify and understand the specific sub-personalities, which are also known as families and parts that make up your internal mental system. Um, hold on one second, Dr. Chesson. I think it's frozen. Um, when you shared the video, did you share sound first and then the video? You did. I did. Let, I'll do it again. Let me try it again. Yeah, because it's frozen. I can, we can, I can hear it. I'm on a little bit. It's still, um, okay. Light. I'll try it again. Let's see. Let me get out of it. Okay, so I I also clicked the um sound. What's it called? Yeah. The optimal so, for video clip. I did the share sound and the optimize for video clip. Maybe I'll do stereo. Well, uh, yeah. yeah. Charlie said um, hearing it through Doctor Chestnut Zoom instead of through the share. Oh, d yeah. Did you share it through the share screen? Yes. And you hit, um, at, before you pu publish it or whatever, you hit share audio on the bottom. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's try it again. ...about the suppressed emotions and learn how to release these feelings. Hello, my name is Dr. Cynthia Chestnut, and I'm a core faculty of the Magic Family Therapy Program at Capella University. We're going to do a telehealth session on internal family systems, also known as IFS. The question is, what is IFS? IFS is a trauma-focused therapy in which you work to identify and understand the specific sub-personalities, which are also known as families and parts that make up your internal mental system. Once you identify these parts, the therapist is going to help you acknowledge your feelings about the suppressed emotions and learn how to release these feelings so that you are freer to address the actual problem and ultimately find more positive ways to manage conflicts on your own. The internal family systems model aims to differentiate the self from the other parts known as managers, firefighters, and exiles, making up a person's inner world. And the ultimate goal of IFS is to unburden or to restore extreme and wounded parts and establish a trusted, healthy, harmonious internal system that is coordinated by the self. So the goal is to help clients find access to the self so that they can heal their wounded parts and bring their minds into balance. I'm going to introduce to you Paul and Charmaine, and we're going to talk about how these parts are showing up and try to identify these parts in a way that the self can learn from these parts and how they show up and take leadership. Well, hello, Paul. Hello, Charmaine. It's hello. So good to see you. Hello. Hello. Charmaine? Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. I'm well. Thank you for asking. Okay. Okay. Paul, how are you? You know, it could be better. Kind of wish we weren't here. But uh, hopefully, we can, something good can come of this because we're just stuck right now, my wife and I. Okay, so tell me more about <clears throat> what that means. And I, I want to hear from both of you. I want to hear about what does stuck mean? What brought you here? What's going on? Well, to me, it just feels like everything has become a big deal and we can't even have simple conversations anymore without them turning into a fight or an argument or just leaving me feeling really 
unsatisfied in the interaction or resentful? Okay. So it's leaving you feel unsatisfied, makes you feel resentful, you're having fights, and you feel like you're not making any resolution in that process. Is that what I'm hearing? Right. Yeah, definitely. There's no resolution to anything. Uh, nothing gets sort of made up where we feel good about the way things have gone. And the frustrating thing for me is it's it can be over little things, big things, medium-sized things. It really doesn't matter. Okay. All right. Thank you, Paul. Charmaine, how about you tell me what it's like for you? What's the problem to you? I do wish things were different. Uh, I. I, I don't know how we got here. I, I'm not sure. Um, you know, it feels like he's like he says he's resentful of me. He he doesn't, you know, he's not patient anymore. I, I'm not sure when this started. I, I, I'm just noticing that he's coming home later and later um, during uh, the weeks that he should be coming home, you know, on time. And I don't normally hear uh, from him until it's you know, nine o'clock at night and he's on his way home when he was supposed to be home at six or 6.30. And I just see that it comes later and later every time. And it just, when he comes home, he wants to unload and talk about his day. And I, I wanna be there, I, I wanna be there, but but when he doesn't wanna be around me and he, he stays out later and later, I just feel, I too feel resentful of. Mm. And so what I'm hearing you say is that you also feel resentful. You also feel, um, I guess, triggered by when he's coming home late. Um, I hear you saying that you're not feeling that you're getting any resolution um, in what's going on as well. Right. Okay. Did I miss anything from both of you? I want us to be, be better, but it doesn't seem like he wants us to be better. Okay. And I, when, when I feel that way, I don't feel like giving more. Okay. Okay. And so you shut down. Yeah, somewhat. You, when you feel that Paul doesn't have the same goal of getting better, you shut down. You don't want to give anymore. That's when you just turn it off. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, yeah. I don't know that he wants to get better with me. I don't know. You know, I, I think I annoy him and and we just get into these frustrated places where we just walk away from each other. Okay. And so, Paul, did you want to add anything to what you just heard Charmaine say? Yeah, I mean, uh, I would love it for it to be different, but it's been bad like this for a really long time. And, you know, I feel like she doesn't really listen to what I say. I feel like I'm talking to her and she asks answers questions that I'm not asking her to answer i'm trying to sometimes get information either to her or from her and it, she gets defensive very easily and god forbid if she ever apologizes if she accuses me of something or um, if she's wrong about something there's never an apology and it's just frustrating like we don't have any kind of making up that feels good it just I've, we're both rolling our eyes saying, here we go again. Okay. It's very disheartening. So what I'm curious about and what I'm hearing is I heard Charmaine say that she's triggered about how late you come home and she eventually starts to shut down and the communication is totally off. So I'm one, is that what I'm hearing, Charmaine? Yes. It's okay. okay. And so Paul, I'm wondering if you also are saying that that kind of conflict in terms of how she responds does that influence you in any way in coming home late do you identify with what she's saying that you come home late like is yeah i have the type of job which is this is nothing new it's been like this for the last 20 some odd years and she knows we have a lot of international clients so there are a lot of late nights at the office there are a lot of times where i have to take clients out who are in town this is nothing new like she acts that's sort of the flavor of the month problem like she'll get mad at me about that but it's always been like that and and that's just one place to kind of land with it like oh yeah all of a sudden i'm coming home late 
am I frustrated with our dynamic and and with her absolutely I, I'm sure I do avoid as I'm sure she does too but me coming home late is nothing new okay and it's so, not necessarily only the coming home late he usually would call right to say, and I do I do know the nature of the job and um it's been consistent right the difference is he would make an effort to call and to let me know like I'm going to be late and you know make sure you know whatever just check in it's it's becoming not that you know it's it, he he's not communicating or reaching out he's just coming home later and later and expects the same wife um and, and, and paul is there anything about what she just said you can validate no i mean i would call her over the years, I would not call her over the years. It is getting easier to not call her because when I do, she knows that I'm usually really busy and I just want to check in and say, okay, I'm going to be late. Uh, I'll even apologize. And, you know, she keeps me on the phone. And now I have to go back to work and I'm frustrated because of what happened with her. And it's not a good situation. So it's just easier not to call her. Okay. So, you are validating in one sense that you did used to call. So that's what I hear. You used to call. But I'm also hearing from you, Paul, that when you call, it turns into a conversation that you're just not ready or prepared to have. And then it leaves you feeling whatever you feel because you're at work and you find yourself taking those feelings into your work. Yeah, right. And so therefore, what I think I'm hearing is that you decide not to call, don't want to have to take whatever comes out of that conversation back into work. And so you instead avoid calling. I'm sure that happens sometimes. Yeah. Okay. And then what about these times that like he's upset with me and then he calls me this name? I mean, he's like, I'm, you know, I he doesn't take my emotion seriously. He doesn't take to heart and instead of he he sort of, you know, just lets him go and says late as he wants to. And I just I think that very much punctuates that he doesn't hear me. He doesn't respect me. You know, he invalidates my feelings about this, you know, all the time. Okay. So are you saying that you feel irrelevant? You feel dismissed? You say that you don't feel significant. Yeah, he doesn't hear me. He does not hear me. He he thinks I'm gonna nag him all the time. He thinks that I don't. You know, he's he's prepared to hear this. He's not trying to 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 listen to why I'm feeling this way or to have any sort of compassion for me at all. He looks right through me. He does not. He, he doesn't care to even express or or listen through what I'm saying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so help me understand what makes it important to have the conversations that you're having with him while he's at work. I, I don't hardly um, call him on his work time, but I for an hour. I'm asking that he just calls and let me know. And he used to do that. Um, he used to do that all the time. And then he stopped, you know, and all of a sudden becomes later and later and he'll, he'll call me in route home, like 15 minutes, I'll be home in 20 minutes. And this is already 830, nine o'clock at night. You know, by that time, I'm just done. You know, why didn't he call me at six o'clock or 530 to let me know this, you know, and then it gets later and later all the time. Okay. And so I'm curious if you heard what Paul said in terms of when he does call and he hears whatever you're saying that creates a conflict for him that he has to now take whatever that conversation is and whatever those feelings that comes up for him into the back to work because he's still at work and so what i'm trying to hear from you is whatever those conversations are maybe you want to give me an example but whatever those conversations are that you have with him when he calls, um, what makes it 
a need to have those conversations while he's at work. He'll call and he's at work and says, you know, he's on his way. And, and maybe I'll say something like, so why didn't you call me at six o'clock? Or, you know, you keep calling later and later. I don't know why that's, you know, that's just a, a question, you know? He's not having to take this burden back to work with him. He says he's leaving. He says his day is done. You know, as he says, he's probably wine and dine and a client. So he's, I don't know. I don't, I think he's making that bigger than it is. Okay. And so I'm hearing that it's very hard for you to hear what it's like for him, how he experienced you when you call. That's, that's what I'm hearing. And so I'm also hearing that it's important for you to let him know what it feels like for you when you're calling, because you're feeling like he's not checking in on you. He's not validating you. You need to hear from him. You know, you need to hear from him and I'm wondering when you hear from him, what does that do for you? Well, I'm relieved that he's fine. You know, he's not hurt somewhere and, you know, but again, when he's, he's just kind of, yeah, I'm on my way home. There's no real emotion behind it. There's no real apology. There's no real, you know, I'm sorry. You know, I know you made, made dinner or you had plans for us or whatever, you know, I'm, you know, I really tried to be nothing. He's just like very cold. I'm on my way. And sometimes I need answers, like, what's going on? You know, why didn't you call me earlier? What kept you? And yeah, I maybe he's frustrated with that line of inquiry, um, but it's a natural thing for me to ask, where are you? What do you, you know, why didn't you call earlier? Okay, okay. But here's the thing, the, the work thing is just one example. So the other day I had asked her, um, if she was going to be doing some laundry because I wanted to have this pair of shorts when I go play golf. And she said, yeah, sure, no problem. It was a few days later. And I was like, hey, by the way, did you get to the laundry? And then she didn't, but she gets all defensive with me, like I'm accusing her of something. And I was just really asking a question. Um, and, and she just gets all bent out of shape and, and stuff like that. So the work thing is just one example. It's like every little thing, even like where we're going to go to dinner becomes a fight. You know, or the other day uh, we were supposed to go to a, a wedding and I asked her, you know, let, let me book the hotel. It was like an hour away and we didn't want to drive home and we were going to just stay over. But I was like, you know, it's in a really expensive part of town and we're not going to get a cheap hotel room. I'll look into using some of my points. Well, the next day I know she booked a hotel and she sent me the link to the com confirmation. And I was like, wait, it's not what we talked about. You know, this was going to be like $500 for this room for one night that we're just going to spend a few hours in. And it's just things like that. We just, you know, uh, there's no working as a team with us. It's just all, yeah, a ball of cook. Mm -hmm. And so the hotel, sorry, I booked the hotel because I didn't want him to worry. I just went ahead. I, I, I don't know anything about these miles or these points or whatever. And I just booked it because I just wanted to do something right in his eyes about the, 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 the laundry. I just got busy. I think he thinks that I'm at home and I'm not working and he's working all the time. And so I got busy. I totally forgot about the shorts. Um, I was, you know, I tried to do my best around that. And, and again, I tried to do my best around booking the hotel so that he didn't have to worry about it. And yeah, I, I, maybe I overstepped or whatever, but we have the hotel. I, I, Again, I don't, I just, I just can't win here. Okay. And so Paul, I'm curious and I'm wondering about, um, what are you hearing from Charmaine in terms of her need? What are you hearing her need, want, desire from you? That she's a moving target. And no matter what I do, uh, it's wrong. That's what you hear? Yeah, so, because she'll focus on this one day and something else another day. And it, it feels like it doesn't matter what I do. Okay. So you hear that she's a moving target. 
help me understand what that means. In the past, she'll say, call, I'll call, but she'll give me attitude. Then I won't call, and that's a problem. Um, it, it just feels like whatever I do, there's never a, hey, thanks, that's, that sounds good. Or real simple, yeah, that sounds fine. Let's do that. It's always, it's always a battle. And I'm always wrong. And you're always wrong. Okay. And so you're, I, I think what I'm hearing from you is that you, you don't feel successful. You feel that you're going to do something else wrong. You feel not going to be able to show up in a way that she demonstrates that she appreciates how you show up. Um, so you feel defeated before you get started. Definitely. Is that what I'm hearing? I definitely feel defeated before we get started. Yes. And then Charmaine, I'm hearing from you is that you're concerned about his well-being. You're concerned about his safety. I hear that you're kind of preoccupied about how's he doing, what he's doing. And when you hear from him, you already have all this um, anxiety and stress around the times that you haven't heard from him and it escalated whatever you were feeling. Yes. It escalates. So by the time that you hear from him, you, you can't appreciate it. And so your fears, your sadness, your frustration, feeling invisible, feeling not valued, that shows up and you can't really have the conversation that you possibly could have that could feel successful. I don't yes. know. Is that yes. what I'm hearing? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So, so what I hear from both of you is that there's a need to feel affirmed. There's a need to feel validated. There's a need to feel recognized in whatever situation you're in when you interact. Um, I'm also hearing that as opposed to paying attention to each other's needs, that you zero in on what it's like for you when you're talking, when you're interacting. Does that make sense? I guess. Yeah, I'm just not sure how to get there. Yeah. Okay. And so what I'm curious about is what are those wounds? What is that underdeveloped place within you? that causes you both to respond to each other in a way that agitates your interaction because you're not getting your need met. What's coming up in you? Charmaine, you want to know he's safe. You want to know he's okay, right? Right. I don't believe that's true. I don't think that's true. I, I think do. she wants to hassle me. So, so Paul she knows that I'm safe. I've been working Paul, at the same job. Paul, thank you for what you just did because what you just did is what she's saying you make her feel. You dismissed how she felt, didn't recognize what she's feeling, but you feel what you feel, and that's what you react to. So you don't trust that she's feeling what she's feeling. Is that what I'm hearing? Mm -hmm. Can you see that? And so I'm curious about what's coming up in you that wants to shut all that out. What's coming up in you that doesn't want to pay attention to what she's feeling and tune into what she's feeling. Instead, uh, yeah, our dynamic is just very toxic right now, you know? And, you know, I don't, I don't know what she's feeling. I can't speak for her. I just know for me, it's very toxic. And I hear that. I hear that. But I also hear it's very difficult for you to identify for yourself what's preventing you from tuning in to what it's like for her. Because that's, that's you. That's what's going on inside of you. So are you feeling 
overwhelmed? Are you feeling? Um, no matter what I do is wrong is what I'm feeling. And that's why it's easy to just give up or roll my eyes. Okay. So you don't feel validated. You don't feel valued. You feel you're wrong before you get started. Uh, you know, I'm not even really shooting for feeling valued and validated. I just want things to go smoothly. I don't want the, everything to be such a big deal. I don't want everything to be a fight. I can just shoot for that, like normal. Just need yeah. things to be normal. Yeah, yeah. And and so let me tell you about this model because what I'm hearing from both of you is how your protectors are showing up. Your protectors are showing up in a way that is avoiding and preventing you from hearing each other. So there's this undeveloped part within that we call exile. There's this part within that gets triggered where you feel sad, you feel guilt, you feel pain, um, whatever feeling that's coming up, you feel defensive, you feel not recognized, Whatever feeling that's coming up, there's this part that comes up where it gets triggered and then you act it out in a way that is either very difficult to manage, which is another part, because you're trying to manage these feelings. You're trying to manage what it's like for you. Um, and then if you're not doing a good job managing it, you don't feel anything. You just want to numb it out. You want to extinguish it. You don't want you don't want to feel it. And so you might deflect, you might avoid, you might do whatever you need to do to not feel what you're feeling. And it can show up as a complete shutdown. It can show up as if you just cut off, you're just not emotionally present and you're not aware of what you're doing in a way that um, could help the situation. Tell me what you hear me saying in defining these parts and how they show up. Either one of you can go first. I want to hear from both of you. Well, I definitely feel protective. I feel like um, him not listening to me or not hearing me feels like I'm alone in this. And I do. I, I, he says he doesn't really want care about you know me. Um, validating or seeing him what whatever I, I i see what he does i am grateful that he's such a wonderful provider for us and i try to do my part as a homemaker so that when he comes home on time or anytime really he feels welcome so when he doesn't respond to me or when he doesn't come home on time I feel like he doesn't appreciate that and he doesn't want to be here. And I get into protective mode. I feel like just doesn't want to be here alone in this relationship, mm -hmm. you know? And so, no, I'm not going to show up all chipper and cherry at 9 30, 10 o'clock at night or what have you. But I do, I do respect and, and, and appreciate his work, work ethic and, and what he does. I don't think he does me. He does, he doesn't really appreciate that in, in me. Right. And so what I'm hearing is what gets triggered for you when I put the whole story together of things that you said thus far is a fear. There's a fear about how Paul is doing. Is Paul well being and okay? You're concerned about him. Um, and you just want to hear his voice. And in hearing his voice, somehow that soothes you. But when he doesn't recognize that that's what you're trying to get from him, then that takes you to another place and you're trying to manage it. You're trying to pull it together. And you feel a little defensive, um, but you also feel vulnerable and, and it increases the pain and hurt that you feel that he's not seeing what you're trying to do and how you care about him. And that's all you want to hear is if he's okay and can he just keep checking in periodically to let you know, I'm good. I'm good, I'm okay. Does that yeah. sound like I'm hearing you? And I know that it's best to hold down the household and I'll, you know, respect for that as well. Okay. And so you're trying to manage. 
you're trying to manage your interactions with them because of how that anxiety comes up, how the concern comes up that you have for him, and you're trying to manage for yourself how um, you keep it together when you're talking to him. Is that, is, is, does that sound like I'm understanding? I try. I try to keep it together when I'm talking to him. It doesn't always show up like that because I have time to sort of stew in, you know, this idea that he's not coming home on time and, you know, doesn't want to be there when he does get there and, you know, that he doesn't really appreciate my part of the team building efforts in our household and our family. They feel unvalued as well. Sure. Feel unrecognized, you know, but you're trying to, to manage yourself and keep it together. Is, is that what I'm hearing? To the best of my ability right now. Okay. So that would be a yes. Yes. Okay. So yes, that is what you're hearing. Okay, good. And so Paul, what I'm hearing from you is it's just too difficult to even tune into any of what she's saying around how she feels, how she thinks, what she's doing. It's just too difficult. And so whatever's being triggered in you, it's just difficult to the point that you just shut down, you anticipate that it's not going to go well when you interact with her. Mm -hmm. And so in that anticipation, you just kind of know that mm -hmm. I, I, I know what I'm going to deal with. Let me get ready for whatever I'm going to deal with just to get through it and to get out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so it sounds like I hear and understand you. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so what's playing itself out for you, Paul, is whatever is being triggered in you, whatever that is, um, maybe a, a, a lack of understanding what it's like for you and how hard you're trying to do whatever you're trying to do, um, how you're trying to take care of your family, how you're trying to take care of her, whatever you feel dismissed about, that she's not recognizing, it's been too hard for you to work on it. You're almost at the point or you're at the point of just giving up and even trying to work on it. So you are already got your defenses up, you're already numbed out that when you interact with her, it's just about trying to get through it. Just trying to get through the interaction. I think that's fair. I think my defenses are up and I just try to survive our interactions. Yeah, I think that's yeah. accurate. Yeah. And so what we call that is like a firefighter. It's you trying to numb yourself out. It's you trying to shield whatever's coming at you. You're shielding it. You don't want to let it in. You let it in. It didn't do well. So now it's like, I'm just going to protect myself and just get through whatever interaction I have with her because she's not meeting me where I need to be met. Does that sound fair? I think so. So we call that the firefighter playing yourself out. And so what's beautiful about both of you and how we describe what it feels like for you is that you're able to pay attention to how you are showing up in your interaction. You're gathering information about how you show up. And to even validate your experience, to validate how we just talked about defining what it's like for you, we have that part of us that is ourself. It's like ourself is observing. It's observing what we're doing. It's observing how we're feeling. It's, a, it's gathering information about what this is like for me. Can you identify with that? Yes. I think so. Okay. Tell me how you identify with that. Use that to tell me what you see and what we just talked about, about what's going on inside of you. I mean, it sounds like you're saying it takes two to tango, which I believe it takes two people to make a relationship and two people to break a relationship. So. You know, I'm sure I'm not doing everything right when when we get together and when things come up, but 
I feel like I'm doing the best that I can. And I'm just looking for things to go smoother than they do. And for her to just not get upset at me all the time. And sometimes I wonder whether she's happy with herself and I'm just like the closest target. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so you observe yourself. Do you see yourself observing yourself and getting your defenses ready because you know you're going to interact with her. I'm sure, yeah. Okay, because that's what's important. Because that's that self. That's that part of you, that most innermost part of you that is observing and setting up how your interactions are going to be with her when you interact. Does that make sense? I don't have this problem with other people. Well, I'm sure that's true, but you had a problem with Charmaine. Mm -hmm, definitely. Okay. And so when you see how yourself, that self part is that, that quiet part of you that's like, okay, this trying to decide, you know, how I'm going to manage myself, how I'm going to deal with whatever is like for me in my experience with Charmaine. Do you see that part of yourself showing up? I'm not sure. Okay. So there are four parts. And the part that is significant is the self. The self can take leadership. The self is that part that is observing that I've just been triggered. I'm triggered. Charmaine triggers me. Do I want to feel the trigger? No. Mm -mm. Right? And so that trigger is what? I'm going to be defensive. I'm going to guard myself. What's the trigger? You tell um, me. Oh, yeah, all the above. I'm going to avoid the situation. I'm going to guard myself. I'm going to try to keep it as straightforward as possible so that she can't twist it around and be upset about anything. Mm -hmm. um, all the above. Yeah. Okay. So so that is your exile because you're, you're triggered. You're feeling defensive you feel like i gotta guard myself i don't want her to pierce my heart i don't want to feel sad i don't want to be frustrated right yeah which is it again all of the above okay. i don't want to i don't want to attack her and i try not to i it's more defense for me mm -hmm. and just wanting to not leave an interaction again thinking okay here we go again uh, something so simple gets met with from my perspective uh anger defensiveness snippiness and it just doesn't feel good and it's been going on a long time right right and so you are recognizing that you're being triggered right mm -hmm. definitely that part of you that's recognizing that trigger is called the self and so when you trigger, you're trying to figure out or trying to organize how you're going to respond, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So you've already positioned yourself around how you're going to respond to Charmaine when you talk to her, when you interact with her. It's like you have a guard that's up, a shield that's up. Does that make sense? Probably, yeah. What makes you say probably, probably? Well, I, it feels like I'm being a doormat if I don't defend myself when she attacks me. I'm not just putting a shield up because I want to stay distant from her. I just know her. And this is this dynamic's been happening for a long time. So right. I either take it and I feel like I'm being abused or like a doormat or I put my shield up. Right. And so you're and I'm not saying that that helps. I know, I know that doesn't help, but right. that's kind of our problem. You know, my shield's up, her shield's up. She's attacking. I'm sure she feels on some level that I attack her. Yeah, yeah. And so the shield that you put up is beyond managing yourself because it shows up very reactive. Okay? You just want to maintain not being pierced. You just want to maintain, I'm not even going to let her affect me, okay? And so your reactions show up where you're just trying to get through it. You've already shut down. Mm -hmm. 
Does that sound correct? Yeah, definitely. And 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 then you're waiting for Dr. Chestnut. when it's done. We have about right. seven minutes yep. left. That's pretty much it. And so that is what thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I know there's a couple questions in the chat. Yeah, so. I was trying to to address them. <laughs> okay, so um, I was at the question. Um, let's see. Um, I was I was cheering on um, Katie Webb's question about Paul being the firefighter when he avoids talking to her. Maybe you can, as we're like watching this unfold, maybe you can point to the parts. I think you did a really good job of saying the self is the part that's noticing the trigger and is there to take care of the the wounded part. But maybe if you can say here was Paul's parts or in, and here were Charmaine's parts, that might clear that up. And then what would you do? So, so I think you... Uh, Katie was writing what she was um, identifying as Paul firefighter part showing up um, because the trigger, the trigger point is the exile. So he feels what he feels is his frustration that he's feeling. And instead of dealing with um, and managing or trying to, you know, get the self to step in to help him to kind of not dismiss her, empathize with her, you know, to respond to her appropriately by um, hearing her and just trying to be empathic to what she's feeling and work through it with her. He's so done with it, as you said, you said Paul's firefighters when he burns the house down <laughs> to protect his vulnerable part. He's, he's just so, he's so done with it that he's numbed out he avoids it in the extreme. Um, he's not coming home. He's not allowing. He's not, what you say, ailing home. He's not coming home. Not ailing is a way that he is protecting. I, I don't know what you mean there, but um, he's done. He, he doesn't even want to deal with this. So that avoidance is an extreme. He's numbed out. So the firefighter is just distinguishing the feelings. It's distinguishing what the exile is feeling. Mm -hmm. um, does that make and sense? So instead of what I understand is instead of speaking for his part, which would be, you know, a part of me is, is really scared now when I feel that you're attacking me, part of me, that part of me. And then Paul takes care of that part. It's not Charmaine's job to take care of Paul's part. It's Paul's Paul's job to take care of that exile and that part instead of the manager coming up. The self takes care of it. So, so you're you're speaking on another part piece of of what should happen. What I'm trying to describe at this point is how to identify the parts when they show up. Okay. Okay. So, so, so yeah. in identifying. If you just focus on how to identify the parts, you'll be able to come up with with whomever you're working with on the interventions that you'll use. Right now, we're just identifying these parts, revealing themselves. Okay. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah. I mean, after we, I mean, I think a really good book um, is Schwartz's you are the one I've been you are the one you've been waiting for which is about how to work with couples in IFS um, and and so I think because I'm sure people are really curious and want more you know and we can you can only give them a taste right so yeah well and that's the taste the taste is how to identify the parts that's what this video is um, aiming to to show you okay is aiming to show you to recognize the parts when they show up and how to identify them. Then you'll move into actually doing interventions to treat them.